happening outside to make it to be here with us this evening. Um, my name is Rena Kripa Johnson. I'm the director, of, the New York director of criminal justice reform for Forward.us, one of the hosts of this event tonight. Um, Forward US is an organization made up of campaigners that span the fields of technology, policy, and advocacy, and we're working together to reform our criminal justice systems and immigration systems. For the last two years, we've had the pleasure of working in New York with an amazing coalition of ad advocates and directly impacted people to reduce the jail and prison populations in New York and to expand opportunities for formerly, formerly incarcerated people in New York. Definitely want to thank City and State, uh, our co-hosts this evening for hosting this forum, um, and a special thanks to our moderator, Jeff Colton from City and State, who's written several important stories about criminal justice reform and the impact of the current system. A very special thank you to each one of the candidates uh, for taking time out of their very busy schedule to be here with us and with you, the people of Jamaica, today to discuss what I think is one of the most pressing issues facing New York, uh, our criminal legal system. Uh, both locally and nationally at this moment, it seems like we've come to a crossroads in thinking about how we approach what we call criminal justice reform. In New York, more locally, elected officials in Albany recently passed a historic set of pretrial reforms which are gonna make huge changes to the bail, speedy trial, and discovery laws here. There's other very active criminal justice reform campaigns going on in New York, including those to legalize marijuana, to decriminalize sex work, to close Rikers and other jails across the state, and to make changes to New York's parole system. Um, but these policies, even though they move us towards reducing incarceration, have not gone without significant opposition, ranging from some lawmakers to large segment, segments of law enforcement, including many prosecutors. The tensions around these conversations has, have forced New York to reconsider fundamental questions like what actually keeps the public safe and whose safety are we talking about when we say public safety? What does real justice look like in our communities? How committed are we to values that we claim to uphold, like you are innocent until proven guilty? We hope to get at some of these big questions tonight as we discuss each candidate's position on a range of criminal justice reform issues. We also hope to dig deeper and explore how each candidate plans to enact their platforms and, and change the culture of prosecutors in Queens and New York. Uh, many people around the city and the whole country are, are having very close eyes on this race and have a lot of things to say about it. Uh, but really the only people whose opinion that matters are yours, the people of Queens. Whoever wins this race will run an office of hundreds of people who will stand up in court every single day and say they represent you, the people. You have the chance to decide who actually will represent you. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Jeff and our candidates and get the forum started. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, thank you very much, Marina. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Colton, a reporter for City and State, uh, and I've been covering the race for the past uh, six months or so. It's been very uh, enjoyable, both politically, it's a fascinating race, uh, but also the amount of policy that these candidates have, have been getting into. Uh, it's, it's just been a very enjoyable thing. Uh, to, to experience, and we're going to be touching upon both those uh, both sides of the race tonight. A couple of logistical issues, each candidate will have uh, 90 seconds uh, to respond to questions. We're going to have a giant, giant red uh, rectangle up here to let you know that when you're done talking. I will try to not be shy about cutting you off. Um, we will start with uh, opening statements, and Start with that. Uh, just, uh, oh, sorry. Well, also, first of all, one thing, uh, Ms. Cabana has told us that she will have to leave a little bit early, so thank you. And Melinda Katz will be showing up late around 7 o'clock. So, the rest of the candidates, hopefully, in for a long haul. Uh, and yes, opening statements, one minute for each of you. And we'll start with Ms. Cabana. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Tiffany Caban. 
Uh, I was born in Richmond Hill. My parents grew up in the Woodside Housing Projects. Certainly who I am and the things that I fight for have been shaped by my experiences in over-policed, over-criminalized, resource-starved communities. And I spent my entire career as a public defender representing over a thousand clients, folks who couldn't afford to defend themselves, who found themselves on Rikers Island because they could not pay their bail, they jumped the turnstile, they struggled with mental health issues or substance use disorder, and every day in court affirmed that our justice system is the single most powerful driver of the continued oppression of our black and brown, our low income, our immigrant, our LGBTQIA plus communities. But also, you could see that if you had money, if you had the right political ties, you could get away with harming our communities. And our DA's office has been a place that has measured success through numbers of convictions and how many people we can throw into changes rather than just asking the simple questions of how do we reduce harm and keep our community safe. As a public defender, I am uh, running to reduce recidivism, to decarcerate our city and keep them rooted in our communities with access to services and supports and to apply the welfare across racial and class lines. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Judge Greg Lazak. I'm running for district attorney, which as you know is the chief law enforcement official of Queens County. I am not a politician, I've been a prosecutor, a homicide prosecutor, and I've been a Supreme Court judge. I have spent my entire career giving voice to the voiceless, such as Deja Robinson, a 14-year-old girl who was sitting on the city bus at Paisley Boulevard when she was murdered by a gang war. Gave voice. To Laura Ann Evelyn, got my voice back, a 17-year-old honor student who was raped and thrown off the roof of Rochdale Village, which is 14-story buildings. I gave voice to Mark Davidson, who was an 18-year-old freshman in college, who was tortured by the police officers in the 106th precinct with a stun gun. And I gave voice to all of these victims throughout my entire career. And I gave voice to people who didn't have a voice. And I intend to do that if elected district attorney of this county. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jose Nieves, and I'm running for Queens County District Attorney. I've been a progressive prosecutor for over 18 years, having served with the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, the New York State Attorney General's Office, the U.S. Attorney General's Office for the Northern District of New York, and the U.S. Army as a military prosecutor. I'm a proud Army combat veteran who served our country over 10 years and one year in Afghanistan. And I've been a community leader for over 25 years. Now, I've been living in Southeast Queens for almost 20 years now with my beautiful wife Vivian, who's here with me today, and my two kids who are 14 and 17 years old. But I didn't grow up in Queens. I grew up in East New York, Brooklyn, during the height of the drug epidemic in the 80s and 90s when crime was high and the, drug was on, the, drug, the war on drugs was playing out on the streets. And I saw violent crime on the streets, but I also saw the discrimination in the criminal justice system. And that's what motivated me to become an attorney. That's what motivated me to be part of a, a change in the criminal justice system, because I was subject to discrimination. I was stopped by the police for no other reason than the color of my skin. And that's why I'm running for Queens County District Attorney. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mina Malik. I'm running for Queens District Attorney for three main reasons. Number one, I'm quintessentially Queens. I grew up in Queens. I'm an immigrant. I raised two sons in Queens. My husband grew up in Queens as well. And while I was growing up in the 1980s and the 1990s, what I noticed was in law enforcement, there weren't many people who looked like us in terms of police officers who jumped out of their vehicles, detectives who policed our communities, prosecutors and judges who sat in judgment of cases that came out of our communities. And as a person who grew up in Corona, Elmhurst, and Jackson Heights, I wanted to change that. So I went and became a, an attorney. I first started my career at the DC Public Defender Service, defending people who couldn't afford an attorney with my husband who was also a public defender. And after that, I came back to Queens after law school and served this county for 15 years as a special victims prosecutor where I dealt with the most heinous types of crimes. 
I was special counsel to Brooklyn DA Kent Thompson, helping him with the conviction review unit, which has since exonerated and freed 26 wrongfully convicted people. And I have done all of the criminal justice reforms that you will likely hear from tonight from all of these candidates. And for this reason, I'm running for district attorney. Thank you. So thank you to the candidates. Also, I forgot the most important part. Uh, we want to hear from you, from Queen's residents, from people at this forum. So uh, I believe that you all have uh, note cards. Or if not, you know, raise your hand. We can get you a note card. Uh, and in the latter half of the event, uh, we will be taking those questions and, and asking the, uh, the candidates themselves. So write down your questions as they come to you. Uh, hold your hand up to get a note card. Hold your hand up when you're done with a note card. And uh, the staff around the room will pick that up. And uh, we, will, we will ask your questions. So sorry I forgot that earlier. Now, my own question for the candidates. Uh, the state legislature just passed some major bail reforms a couple months ago, but uh, the mayor, Bill de Blasio, and some others had a problem with them in that uh, judges are still not allowed to consider a defendant's so-called dangerousness uh, when deciding whether they would be det detained before trial. Uh, advocates of the approach say it's a common sense measure to keep violent individuals off the streets, and opponents say that it's a subjective measure and it is, perpetuates racial biases in the criminal justice system. I would like to hear, uh, each of you will start at the end with Ms. Malik, uh, just what are your thoughts on the judges uh, being able to use dangerousness, and uh, you know, is that a good factor in, the, uh, in bail? I do think it is a good factor. I actually practiced in a jurisdiction that ended cash bail in 1992 in Washington, D.C. Two of the factors they consider are in terms of whether a person is going to return to court or not is whether they are a flight risk or danger to the community. And I hearken back to the Wendy's case, as many of you must remember in 2000, where two men went into the Wendy's on, in Main, on Main Street in Flushing and basically killed or attempted to kill everybody inside the restaurant. And so this person should be considered a danger to the community. And for this reason, this is the countless numbers of cases where you have to consider whether a person is a danger to the community or not should be taken into consideration because you have cases like that where you must protect public safety. You know, first, the dangerousness of, a, of the accused is, is a factor that's already used in other jurisdictions. And it's a factor that has been used for many, many years in the federal district that has not resulted in discriminatory practice or discriminatory impact. So I, I believe that the dangerousness of the accused is actually a, a good thing for the judge to have at his disposal uh, to evaluate, to see if a person is a, is a, is a risk to the public or a risk to individual um, people. And this becomes particularly important with domestic violence cases, where there's a history of abuse. And you have an individual who has abused an individual, hurt an individual before, that violence has escalated, and now the, you know, the judge has information, and the district attorney has information in their hands that leads them to believe that this violence might escalate to the ultimate uh, crime of murder. Uh, and I think we need to consider that, because people's lives are at stake. And that's why you know, experience matters and experience trumps uh, political rhetoric. Because when you're trying to determine who's the, and which individual is, is a danger to society, which individual is a flight risk, you have to have that experience. And after 18 years, I have that experience doing it every day in, 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 in not just Queens, in Brooklyn, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, in the military, and also at the New York State Attorney General's Office. So I've seen what right looks like, and that's why uh, you know, experience matters, and, and you know, we, we have to understand that one of the things that we will not have, as a, you know, in my administration, is cash bail. We're not going to have cash bail because I do not believe that anyone should be sitting in jail simply because they can't afford to buy their freedom. So, and that's not saying contrary things because you, there's so many other ways of you know ensuring somebody's return or supervision while they're in the community to make sure that they don't harm anybody and that people are safe. Uh, from them. Thank you. I sat for 15 years as an elected Supreme Court judge and I heard 
hundreds of bail applications during those years. As a judge, you consider three factors. One, the severity of the offense. The second factor you consider is the criminal record of the accused in front of you. And the third factor is whether or not he's gonna to return to court, the flight risk, whether he has a history of warrants. Those are the three factors. Uh, Ms. Malik mentioned the Wendy's case. I've seen a number of cases like that where guys out on bail on a case and commits a heinous crime. That particular case, I was the chief of homicide. I was in that freezer when we found the people down there. Five people were killed and two were attempted to be killed. Horror, horrible, horrible crime. New York is only one of three states that does not allow a judge to consider the dangerousness of a defendant before him when he's deciding whether or not to set bail or remand him. We should be able to consider the dangerousness to the community of a person who stands in front of a judge. The DA should be allowed to apply for that and the judge should be allowed to consider that. New York is only one of three. 47 other states allow a judge to take that into consideration. So I would move the legislature to consider adding that to the bill, adding that to uh, as a factor that they may consider. Thank you. So I, I want to talk about this question kind of directly in the way that you framed it in terms of the folks that are pro, uh, pro and, and con dangerousness, talking about objective and subjective measures in terms of the criticism that um, including dangerousness, uh, there's risk of this subjective view where, again, we continue to weaponize um, our, our laws and our practices in ways that continue to oppress our, our black and brown. Um, and poor communities. So just jumping off of what Judge Lasak said in terms of the three pieces that you can consider, I kind of want to focus on the third, which allows sort of an objective way to look at dangerousness in a sense and removing some of that subjectivity, right? So not just the person's community ties, not just their ability to return to court, but that combination of evaluating the strength of the case and the severity of the case is in and of itself a way to evaluate dangerousness in a way that, that does not allow for the subjectivity we find when you consider dangerousness with a person who is accused of a crime, not found guilty of anything yet, right? Um, so, you know, one of the things that we should be mindful of is the way that, and this is where, again, the experience does matter, right? Recognizing as a public defender in court about how a lot of these policies and practices do end up disproportionately impacting certain communities. You know, in terms of dangerousness, just to give you a little bit of an example, I've had clients who I've represented and, you know, sort of kind of behind the scenes and aren't supposed to say it, it speaks to dangerousness, uh, but saying my client was, was shot in the projects. And so the intimation being, well, he must be part of a gang because if you are shot at and you are brown and you live in the projects, you must be part of a gang. And that's a reason to talk about why they're dangerous. So I believe in taking an objective point to this and saying that you can use the measure of looking at the severity of the case and the strength of the case to really evaluate whether you should be asking for remand on a case because I will not ask for cash bail. Uh, I believe all the candidates in the race yeah, generally agree that Queens incarcerates too many people currently. Uh, one alternative to traditional jail sentences is electronic monitoring, uh, ensuring that defendants don't jump bail by uh, you know, a wristband or a leg band or something. What are your thoughts on the practice, and would you support the use of electronic monitoring as district attorney? And uh, we'll start again at the end with Ms. Malik. So I, I definitely think that there should be a presumption of release on your own recognizance. But if there are people who need to be monitored for whatever reason, then there's a sort of a sliding scale that you can take, right? So there's release on your own recognizance, and then you can move towards weekly check-ins, bi-weekly check-ins with pretrial services, or some sort of counselor, or a probation officer, or someone of that nature to make sure that someone is keeping tabs on the person who is accused of the crime. So I think that there, it, there's a sliding scale. When we get to electronic monitoring, and we're talking about putting someone on an ankle bracelet. I think we need to be very careful about 
basically incarcerating them electronically and allowing them to only move in certain areas or, or in certain segments of the population. We also need to be careful about the algorithms that are used to determine whether somebody should be on electronic monitoring because sometimes those algorithms in and of themselves, looking at those algorithms, they are racially implicated and have racial have a racial disproportionate impact in and of themselves given the information used in the algorithms. So I think we need to be very careful about using electronic monitoring. I support electronic monitoring. I think it's, it should be a tool in our, in our toolbox as prosecutors and judges because, you know, it, as opposed to incarcerating somebody, you're allowing them to come back to the community where they live, you're allowing them to stay with their family, you're allowing them to engage in the, um, in the defense process by meeting their, their, their attorneys, and you can monitor them. And, and it's, these are all benefits other than incarcerating. So what's the alternative? The alternative is either you have them in Rikers Island or they're at home using an uh, ankle bracelet. And I think nine times out of 10, people would prefer to be at home than Rikers Island. But you also have to be careful because like everything else, like the stop and frisk, or every other a tool, law enforcement, it can be used and abused, and it can be overused. And the, and the reality is if we just use it as an automatic, this is where we're gonna go for every case, then we are, you know, we are engaging in a practice where we're choosing people based on their circumstances just to have monitoring. We, we're, and nine times out of 10, it's gonna be individuals of color, it's gonna be black and brown individuals from our community, and then we're gonna end up creating a new set of uh, in incarcerated individuals who are incarcerated within their own community because they can't move around or they're constantly being told to come in. And also the electronic uh, monitors themselves are not perfect. And, and that's a problem because when an individual is not violating their, their conditions of, of release, and they're not leaving the jurisdiction, but the ankle bracelet indicates that they are, they can be violated and arrested. And that's in itself an, it's an injustice because it's, it's victimizing the individual again, processing them again without them doing anything wrong. Thank you. I agree with Mr. Nieves. I think it's better for an accused to be awaiting trial in his house or her house, in the living room, or going to work and being in Rikers Island awaiting trial. Because sometimes you wait on Rikers Island for a very, very long time. So as long as we use these carefully and there's no malfunction in them, they're checked periodically, I see no problem in that because I'd rather have an accused at home with his family at night rather than sitting on Rikers Island. Thank you. very wary of moving to uh, a, a space where we are overusing the use of ankle monitoring and electronic monitoring and essentially building something that resembles decarceration. One of the things that happens when you are placed on any sort of monitoring system, you also have to understand that these folks are charged fines and fees. And so what they're exposed to is if they're poor and cannot pay, those are technical violations that land them in cages, right? Um, when life happens and they don't get home on time because of childcare issues or whatever it is, those are the kinds of things that land them on Rikers Island. Um, when we talk about those risk score algorithms, I just wanted to go into that into a little bit more detail. What we're seeing is specifically that they are uh, racist and classist in the very ways that our system as a whole has functioned. The, the factors that they're looking at inherently move to folks who come from lower income black and brown communities. The questions that they ask to get your score. How old are you? If you're younger, your risk score is higher. Do you have a cell phone? Your risk score, if you don't, you have your risk score is higher. Um, are you in school or working? Your risk score is higher. What we need to do is move into a system where we're simply asking people, how can we support you to get into court? Because overwhelmingly people want to come back to court. And our, our bail funds are a perfect example of that. By simply doing little things like providing metro cards, email and, and text message responses, 97, 98% of the time, people are coming out back to the court. Why? Because they want good outcomes and they want to remain in their communities. We're thinking about this all wrong in terms of, of having all of these limitations and saying if you don't do them, we'll put you back uh, into a jail cell rather than saying how can we support you in your everyday life where you're struggling to get back to court. And that's what we should be looking at. Thank you. So some 
breaking news just today. The city announced a memorandum of understanding with the NYPD to reduce the number of arrests in schools, uh, with the explicit goal of ending the school to prison pipeline. Uh, I know the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office has a special bureau, the School Advocacy and Ju Juvenile Crimes Bureau. I'm actually not sure about Queens. Uh, tried to Google around, I couldn't find it, so maybe you know. Uh, but under your uh, Queens District Attorney Office, would you would your office have such a bureau, and, and, and what special care would you take towards uh, crime in schools and, and treating juvenile uh, offenders? And we'll start with uh, Mr. Nieves for this one. So the Queens District Attorney's Office does not have a school advocacy bureau. And the School Advocacy Bureau is a very important bureau in the Brooklyn DA's office. I, I spent 11 years at the Brooklyn DA's office, and uh, I know the bureau, and I know the work of the bureau, and it's good work because it focuses on trying to provide uh, a gap fill, trying to bridge the gap between the criminal justice system and the schools. And this is how they do it. They try to use the, the services that are available to the district attorney's office, the services that are available to family court, the services that are available through uh, diversion programs like the Osborne Association, like Fortune Society, to really provide supportive services to the counselors and the schools. This is, they, they do this to divert the kids from the criminal justice system. The first thing a child should, should not be done is arrested for an offense at a school. Because why, why are we uh, criminalizing our young people, saddling them with criminal convictions so that for the rest of their life they're, they're declined or they're uh, rejected from getting employment, from getting housing, from getting a license to, 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 to serve as a barber, just because of a minor offense. And the School Act Advocacy Bureau diverts more kids away from the criminal justice system than it actually is involved in the prosecution. So it's more of a diversion unit than a prosecutorial unit. And that's why I, I agree with the unit, and I think that we should have one at the Queen's District Attorney's Office, because if we're serious about ending the school to prison pipeline, we have to provide those services. And now with the Raise the Age Law, we can even uh, further do that by, by referring a lot of these kids to family court, where they have more services and more of an infrastructure to provide services, not only to the child that's involved in the criminal justice system, but to the family and the community that surrounds that child. That's the way to go rather than just incarcerate our problems or incarcerate our children. One of the things I have proposed since we started this campaign is that if elected I would hire 18 community assistant DAs, one for each of the assembly districts in Queens, and that assistant DA would be responsible for maintaining relationships with the civic leaders, the community leaders, the political leaders, the police precincts in that assembly district, so they get to know everyone in that district and they become a pipeline from the district to the DA's office. One of the things I want to do is increase the number of programs for children in school to come into the courthouse as part of their programs at school because they learn so much when they come in, they watch a hearing, they watch a trial, and it's good for them because otherwise, if they don't come to the courthouse, that just becomes a foreboding building on Queens Boulevard in Kew Gardens where they know that their friends go there in the morning sometimes and they don't see them again for years. And they get this distaste for that building, a fear factor for that building, and the people working in it. I would love to get programs so they can find a career path into that building. Maybe they want to be a judge one day, a lawyer, an ADA, a police officer, a probation officer, a court officer. I want them to be part of the system. I want them to grow up wanting to be part of that building and make it a better building so everyone in that building reflects our most diverse county. Thank you. start well before the point where we're saying well, we're going to have 
less police officers in our schools or, or making less arrests in schools, understanding that it starts from a place where our zero tolerance pol policies have been weaponized against our, uh, again, predominantly black and brown students where they're being suspended at increased rates that destabilize their lives, their, the classrooms, the entire community as a result. And then what happens from there is a natural progression in terms of how the police interact and deal with these children. One, we need to not ever charge a child as an adult, but also when we think about the job of the district attorney being one of public safety, not to punish just for the sake of punishing, then we know that we have to be investing in preventative measures and not just be reactive. We spend so much money investing in our prison industrial complex, we should be putting money into schools, not jails. And so what does that look like, right? It looks like putting more money into our schools, certainly using the federal asset forfeiture funds that the office has and asking schools where they can get more support, whether it's for counselors, um, restorative justice uh, programs in place between students so that they're learning about conflict resolution, um, getting more art programs in place, because all of those things, studies show, reduce antisocial behavior. So now you're interrupting violence before it escalates, before you have to get a police officer in, involved, for example. So doing those kinds of things are the best way to um, reduce and end, end that school to prison pipeline. But again, ending from a place of also, we will treat children like children, we will not prosecute them as adults. So as Deputy Attorney General, I oversaw the prosecutions of juveniles and what we did was make sure that we were treating children like children. It's extremely important. This brain science shows that a child's brain is not developed fully until the age of 25. And so we can't hold children accountable in the adult system when their brains aren't fully formed in an adult manner. And so what I would do as district attorney is make sure that we start a youth advocacy bureau where we're partnering with our communities, we're partnering with the youth, we're partnering with our schools, and we're making sure that we're breaking the school to prison pipeline by initiating anti-truancy initiatives so that children remain in school and making sure that we are using funds that are allowable under the law from the district attorney's office for after school programs, summer programs, so that children are engaged in positive activities and not left to their own devices or in their neighborhoods out on the streets. This is extremely important. The other thing that I would do, which is what we did at the Attorney General's office, was start a restorative justice initiative. And it was so positive with the juveniles in the restorative justice program that we expanded it to 18 to 24 year olds. So this is another way that we can make sure we're giving people second chances and keeping them out of the juvenile justice system as well as the criminal justice system. A brief follow-up that came to mind. Uh, so, like, yes or no, but then maybe one sentence of explanation if you need it. Uh, should any school, any public school or private school in New York, have a metal detector at the door? And we'll start at the end with uh, Ms. Malik. Can you just come down this one? I think we need more counselors in schools, not cops. I always go back to my old school friend, Kate Lane. I see a sea of blue uniforms and a sea of metal detectors, and, and it makes the school feel like an institution. Not an institution of learning, but an institution of incarceration. And, I, and you don't get that in other schools. You don't see that in Bayside High School. You don't I'm see so that sorry, in other schools. Just, just one sentence. So I do not support the, the, the metal detectors. What we do need is more programs, more after-school programs, and more diversion programs. I don't think it's good having police officers in schools, but the parents usually do want that, so I don't know. I'm not an expert in the area, okay? I'm not an expert in the area. No, we should not have metal detectors in our schools. All right, uh, another, uh, no, it's not really youth related question. Cause you know what, everybody smokes cannabis. Very, uh, there's a lot of people out there. Uh, so after months of negotiation, marijuana is not going to be legalized in New York this year. Uh, however, as we speak, I think, I was just checking Twitter before this, the state legislators are considering a decriminalization bill. Uh, so not full legalization, but just uh, decriminalize. I don't have the details, so I know nobody can comment on the exact details. But uh, I, I want each of your thoughts on this. Uh, 
you know, would, would decriminalization be enough? Uh, decriminalization of cannabis use be enough for the state of New York? Do you support full legalization or another path? And we'll start with Judge Lacey for this one. I think the uh, cities out west of Denver, I think they're experiencing some problems since they had uh, decriminalization. I personally, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. Uh, would I prosecute marijuana? No. Oh. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. Really simply, decriminalization is not enough to start undoing the harm that has resulted over the criminalization of, of marijuana because the war on drugs has certainly been a war on black and brown folks. When we look at the, all of the convictions and what it has done to people's lives, I mean, I, I, I have represented clients where um, due to a conviction for marijuana, their entire family was evicted out of NYCHA housing. Right? Like these are very real consequences, and there is no difference between the amount of black and brown folks that are smoking marijuana and the, the, the number of white folks that are smoking. And so understanding that there are impacts. We need to legalize. We need to also pass legislation that automatically expunges records. We need to make sure that there is nobody in pain who is serving a sentence for, mar for a marijuana-related offense. And then when it is legalized, we need to make sure that the very communities that economically benefit from that are the communities that were devastated by the ways that those laws were enacted against them. So decriminalization does not go really far enough. office when our special counsel to the Brooklyn DA, Ken Thompson, we were the first prosecutorial agency in the country to decriminalize the low-level possession of marijuana. And we took it to the city council, to, I'm sorry, to city hall, we took it to the police commissioner's office at the time, and they were not for the policy. But what we did was we decided that we were going to go ahead anyway and not prosecute these low-level offenses because it, we realized that it disproportionately impacted our youth in a negative way and our black and brown communities of color. Now with respect to legalization, the state and the legislature seem to be moving in that direction across the nation, but I think what's important to note is that we need to look at states where it has been legalized already and see what the issues are that they're facing so that we can deal with those issues before they ever become issues in this state. And what I'm talking about that is in Colorado, there was, as soon as they legalized marijuana, they saw an uptick in car accidents, all right? Mm -hmm. And we cannot have that as New York State. The other thing that they saw an uptick in is overdoses with the edibles, marijuana edibles, because kids would see the black and brown cookies, the gummy bears that contain marijuana, and they would ingest them and eat them and then end up overdosing on them. So we're, we're moving towards legalization as a country. I think we need to study the issues that other jurisdictions are facing before we legalize it here. But I do firmly believe that when it becomes legalized, we need to make sure that the resources and the revenue from legalization of marijuana are given back to the communities that were disproportionately impacted in the first place. I support the decriminalization of marijuana because when I grew up uh, in a high crime area, I saw the war on drugs play out in the streets of my community. And what I saw was that the criminal justice system was weaponized against individuals that lived in my community, weaponized against people that I grew up with, that I went to school with. The Rockefeller the drug laws have put them away for low level offenses, for low level possession of drugs, and it just completely devastated generations of my community. So that's why I feel we need to stop the, de the criminalization of the, you know, of our, of our communities, of our black and brown communities using these drug possession uh, laws that don't make any sense, that are, are being, uh, you know, over-policed in, in a way that's discriminatory because they don't, they don't exercise uh, the same police, uh, you know, discretion in, in other areas than they do in, in zip codes that I grew up in and the zip code that I live in. So I want, you know, if you can't, you can't enforce the law equally, then the law needs to be decriminalized. 
That way everybody's going to see their team in the same thing. And this is so important. And you know, I agree with the other candidates that we, once we do legalize cell marijuana, which we will come, what we need to do is take all the profits that come from the legalized industry and reinvest them in the communities that have been historically criminalized for that very possession of that very drug. Because that, will, only that will level the playing field and also only that will do justice because for years we've been criminalizing individuals in our youth specifically for these low level offenses of possession of marijuana. And we also have to go back and expunge all those prior convictions and prior uh, you know, records uh, for possession of marijuana because how can we in good, in good conscience continue to, to have those uh, individuals walk around with criminal convictions knowing that now it's legal? It's, it, that's not justice and we have to do that. So three of you have been prosecutors, all of you have the support or endorsements from some prosecutors, and all of you want to be a prosecutor. Uh, name one prosecutor who you see as an inspiration and uh, explain why, and we'll start with Ms. Kaban. One prosecutor that I certainly see as an inspiration and then just am so also humbled and uh, grateful to, to actually be endorsed by is Rachel Rollins, the Suffolk County uh, prosecutor. She's the prosecutor in Boston who ran on a bold, progressive, decarceral campaign and became the first black woman to be elected as a DA in Boston. Um, what she did was unprecedented. She stood with her communities, uh, put out that, that, um, that memo of what her policies were and was unafraid of the pushback and she was successful because she had built a coalition along the way. She knew that her, her communities were gonna stand by her and support her because she was fighting for them. So certainly she is uh, a person that I, I absolutely look up to. So one prosecutor who I think is an absolute inspiration is Carter Stewart, the former U.S. Attorney under the Obama Administration for the Southern District of Ohio. He is married to Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow. And because of their relationship, it has influenced him in terms of what he has done in criminal justice reform. So he currently works with a foundation that works with Fair and Just Prosecution, John Jay School of Criminal Justice, and works to make sure that the criminal justice system is fair, which is also what he did as U.S. Attorney under President Obama. And for that reason, that's why I think he is one of the preeminent and nationally renowned, nationally recognized criminal justice reformers and experts in this country. And that's not all. I've also been endorsed by the three former heads of the D.C. Public Defender Service who know what it takes to run an office of 600 people with 300 attorneys. The, the prosecutor that inspires me is Eric Gonzalez, the district attorney of uh, Brooklyn. Because Eric Gonzalez and I worked together for, for a very long time. He was in the office for 18 years, I was in the office for 11 years. We grew up as prosecutors together. And we would always sit down in our offices and talk to each other. We would talk to each other about it. When we became prosecutors, how, why did we become prosecutors? To change the system. How can we change the system from within? How, as a prosecutor, can we affect change in individuals' lives and save kids from the criminal justice system and make a difference in our criminal justice system so our individuals are not uh, criminalized because of drug addiction, criminalized because of mental illness. So our veterans that come back from, from Afghanistan and Iraq aren't criminalized because they suffer from PTSD. And as we sat there and talked about these you know, these ideas and, and we bounce them off of each other. We never realized that he would then become the district attorney of Brooklyn and I would then become a candidate for the district attorney of Queens. But I, I think that is, 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 a, is true, uh, a true omen, because we were individuals growing up in the criminal justice system that we, we were practicing in, changing every day, making a difference in, and we, we saw the future, and the future was promising. The future was promising because we knew that you had to get in the game to change it. And that's exactly what we did. And that's exactly what he's doing in Brooklyn. Because when you talk about all these programs like decriminalizing marijuana, ending cash bail, uh, providing diversion programs for individuals uh, with, with drug addictions, these are all programs that they're already doing in Brooklyn. Right across the borough, they're already doing. 
And that's because him, like me, have seen the discrimination, have seen the, 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 the incarceration of our criminal justice system, and know that that's an injustice, and know we have to change. And I will follow him wherever he goes with regards to whatever policy he makes, because the policies that he makes, I know, come from the heart, because he grew up in East New York, and this is I did, and he wanted to change the system just as I did. Prosecutor, it's been an inspiration to me is Judge Tom Demacus. When I was uh, a young age, delivering newspapers after school, I would read the papers, and there was a, the sensational case at that time was the Alice Primmons case, a woman who was accused of killing her two infant children. And I followed that case, and that inspired me to go to law school. And then while I was in law school, I was an intern in the DA's office, and Judge Demacus was the chief assistant. And he's been my mentor my whole career. And he told me, just simply, as long as you do the right thing, that's the best advice he ever gave me. Know that you're doing the right thing. And when the DA's office had this program where they were taking statements in central booking, he suppressed the statement. And everyone was in an uproar. But they should have listened to him because the appellate courts agreed after years of you know, haggling back and forth about how to change his script and everything. Because he knew that was not the right thing to do. Because when a prisoner came in, he saw a person in a suit, he thought that was his attorney. And it was really an assistant district attorney. And statements uh, like that were problematic because the man thought it was his attorney. So Judge Demacus, God bless him, he's still alive. He handled the most serious cases in the county the murder of police officer Eddie Byrne, the Howard Beach case, and many, many more. So he was my inspiration. Thank you. All right, thank you. This is the last question for Ms. Kibon, so we'll let her leave uh, after an answer. But I had to ask this one. We are in a college setting, so I wanted to get a little bit philosophical here. And uh, you know, in some ways, this job is all about public safety. And I wanted to ask the candidates up here, what does public safety mean to you? What does public safety look like to you? Is, and, and does a greater police presence in Queens mean public safety, or is it something else? And we'll start with this about. When I think about public safety and what it means, stability equals public safety. When you know where you're going to lay your head down at night, when you have access to education and job opportunities, access to harm reduction services, mental health services, those are the best ways to achieve public safety. Uh, and we should be focusing on healing communities, uplifting communities, so that they can just, not just survive, but thrive. I often think about the fact that the communities that I grew up in, South Richmond Hill, Queens, the communities my parents grew up in, uh, the Woodside Housing Projects, the communities that, of the clients that I have served. When we needed help, too often, the government sent cops. And when you go into other communities and they need help, they get access to services and supports. I think about the fact that my story is not one that I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and got to be a lawyer and do all of these great things, but that there is literally nothing, almost nothing, at any given moment that separates me from my clients on any given day but for luck and access to privileges. And the one thing that I consistently point to is the fact that my dad got a union job, which meant that I had access to a roof over my head, to healthcare services, to an education, and probably most important to me personally, access to therapy services as an adult so that I could have reparative experiences and engage with the world in healthier ways to break cycles, to break dynamics that um, were really harmful and could have landed me or my neighbors or the friends that I grew up with and have for some in our criminal justice system. So stability, that's what public safety is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mon. And we will uh, actually we'll switch up, we'll go the other direction. So Judge Lasik, next, uh, what does public safety look like to you? Public safety is when you don't have to worry about your children being out at night. Public safety is when you feel safe, when you feel safe. As the murder rate started to increase, I became the chief of homicide in Queens in 1984. There were 180 murders. 
crack came into Queens in the winter of 85, and by 1991, there were 357 murders in Queens. It doubled because of the, the crack epidemic and all the violence that was entailed. Nobody ever heard of a drive-by shooting before that time period. Public safety is when you, as I said, you don't have to worry about your kids. When the crime rate came down, people still didn't feel safe, because there's a difference. They weren't sure. Now everyone feels safe. I think most people I talk to feel safe. And uh, I think we're in a good place right now, but we gotta be ever vigilant, because if we ever get another drug like crack, that thing can go out of control, one, two, three. When crack came in, we never heard of a drive-by shooting. We had a grand jury witness that was murdered that testified against one of these crack gangs. No one ever murdered a grand jury witness. And then it culminated with the parole officer who was murdered because he had the audacity to file a violation against Fat Cat Nichols, one of the drug uh, kingpins in South Jamaica. And it culminated with the murder of Eddie Byrne, police officer Eddie Byrne. They finally reacted at that point. So, feeling safe is our goal. Right now, I think most people feel safe. Thank you. you know, I have a different experience with Judge Lisa. You know, I, I, I see public safety as two things. One is, I think of my son, who's 14 years old. And he wants to go outside and play with his kid, with his friends, he wants to go to the movies, he wants to you know, be a kid. And I, and I worry about two things. One, that he's a victim of a crime. Somebody would try to rob him, hurt him, assault him. But the other thing I worry about is his interaction with the police. Will he be stopped by the police? You know, for the last few years, my job as a special prosecutor investigating and prosecuting police officers who killed unarmed civilians. Not in New York, just in, in, in New York City, but all over the state, from Albany to Schenectady to Long Island. And what I've seen time and time again, and what I've seen in my, my experience, is that when we have a situation with the police, they escalate the force too quickly. They escalate the violence too quickly. So when I talk to him, I have two conversations with him. I tell him to be aware of his surroundings, and, and, and try not to, to, to always look around you, to always be aware of somebody's looking at you, always keep yourself in a safe place, but also if the police stop you, to know how to in, in, in deal with that encounter. To always, you know, and it's the same talk that I was giving when I was a kid. And it's always been the same way, but we have to change that. We have to change it. Because if it doesn't change, then our children and our grandchildren are gonna be having the same conversation. And I think public safety is two things, fair, and equal justice for all. Thank you. What public safety looks like to me is keeping people safe from harm, and when harm happens, that we try to ensure that it doesn't happen again. I raised two sons here in Queens. From the moment they were able and old enough to take the subway, I always worried whether they were going to be able to come home. And particularly with my sons raising two black sons has its own issues in terms of whether the police are going to stop them on the street or whether they're going to be stopped in the family car. So I've had to have conversations with them that other parents don't need to have. But in terms of public safety and what that means, I firmly believe that we should not be criminalizing what usually are the three root causes of crime, which is crimes of poverty, such as Jerome Murdo, who was caught in a housing, public housing stairwell, who was sleeping on a cold winter's night, and who was incarcerated on $2,500 bail at Rikers Island simply for sleeping in a stairwell, for people with mental health disorder, or people with substance use disorder. I think that we need to be figuring out what are the treatment and the services that we can offer people so that they don't recidivate and they don't come back into the criminal justice system because that's how we are going to ensure public safety long-term and in the long run for our county and as our community as a whole. But I'd go further than that. A lot of times when people pay their debt to society, they don't have a pathway to success when they come out after having paid that debt. And as Deputy Attorney General with the Attorney General's office and Attorney General Carl Racine, we made sure that we offered people a pathway of success to education and to job opportunities. And we hired people who were formerly justice involved or formerly incarcerated. 
And that is what the new vision for the district attorney's office and the 21st century prosecutor mentality should be. So that people really come back into, the, into society and don't recidivate, don't go back into the criminal justice system where they commit crime and crime again. Just another reminder to the audience, I uh, only have a couple questions left. We want audience questions. So uh, if you need a piece of paper, raise up your hands. Uh, one of our uh, helpers will get you one. And then if you're done writing, also raise it up and pick it up. And I'll take some questions soon. Uh, but a question for me is that this race has been getting a lot of national attention, especially in this past week. We've seen some endorsements from non-New Yorkers. We've also seen a lot of money coming in from out of state and out of Queens. Uh, I want to know your opinions. Is this a good thing that the Queens District Attorney's race is getting so much uh, outside attention and, and financing? Or would you prefer it just be a race for the citizens of Queens or, or New York City? And uh, we'll start at the end with Ms. Malik, please. Well, I, I think it is a good thing if you're talking about people who are really broken. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think, it, thank you. I think it is a good thing if we're talking about people who are truly interested in criminal justice and criminal justice reform and who know what they're talking about. So I'm extremely proud to have the endorsements of three former heads of the DC Public Defender Service, the best public defender service in the entire country, as well as former and current prosecutors who know what criminal justice reform looks like and who know what it's like to run an office. I also have civil rights attorney endorsements such as Ben Crump, who represented the Trayvon Martin families as well as the Michael Brown families. And so these are all people who have endorsed me who understand, who truly understand what criminal justice means and what criminal justice reform means. And when they're investing in me and my vision for the future of the district attorney's office, I think people should take heed of that as opposed to people who have nothing to do with criminal justice and nothing to do with the people of Queens County. You know, I don't agree. I don't agree with it because what it's not about exposure, it's about influence. And what they're saying is, they've never been to Queens, they don't know Queens, they've never visited Queens, but they're gonna tell the people of Queens what's good for them. And I think that's wrong. And I think they're stepping over their, 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 you know, their line and, and they're going into, into territory they shouldn't be getting into themselves into. Because unless you live in this community, you don't know what's going on in this community. Unless you live in Southeast Queens and you've been followed by the police officers, going home, you don't know what the situation is. Unless you're, 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 you're worried about your child going to school because they go take, up, take the bus and you know individuals have been hurt on that bus, you don't know what the issues are in Queens. So I, I beg to differ with, with, with Ms. Malik because I think that the people who know the best about what Queens needs are Queens residents. They know what's going on. They're the ones to decide. Hey, when you have these other politicians coming in, why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? They're doing that because they're not looking out for our interests. They're looking out for their own interests, their own political goals and, and aspirations because they want to be president, because they want to be this, they want to be that. They could care less what happens in Queens. They could care less. And the honest truth is, they need to butt out. Thank you. So I just need to correct the record on that. I wasn't talking about politicians. I was talking about actual people who understand criminal justice and who are nationally renowned criminal justice reform experts. I absolutely agree with you, Ms. Nieves, in terms of the politicians. Bernie Sanders is why we have Trump in the White House today. So he should not be endorsing anyone in this particular race. This is why, this is why a district attorney should have been a prosecutor, like my two colleagues up here, because politicians do not belong in the DA's office, all right? Do not belong there. 
You cannot run a DA's office if your only experience was a political one where you were a city councilman or a senator or an assembly person or a borough president. Because in that world, in that world, there's a different set of rules. I've been going to these forums now, how many months? Okay. And I see the politicians who are not here today. And after a few of these sessions, I said to them, I admire you because in the court system, whether you're a defense attorney, a DA, or a judge, or a police officer, when someone asks you a question, you answer the damn question, all right? I praise these politicians because I sat and watched how they can talk for 10 minutes without answering one part of a question. That is an art. That is an art. I wish I had that talent. I wish I had that talent. Because my friends watch me on the phone, why didn't you say more? I said, I answered the question. I'm not gonna just talk for the sake of talking. But I'm taking advantage of this now. That's why you don't need a politician. They follow a different set of rules. They have a different code. And it's called survival. And now there are politicians in this race who need a job. Need a job, they're term limited. I was re-elected to a 14 year term and I gave up my job. I resigned after nine months, all right? You think well about that. Time, I went way over, but I, you owed me time. But saying we're in a college here, want to get uh, philosophical, you know, what does public safety look like to you? Does that mean increased policing, decreased policing? Uh, what does it mean? Oh, and sorry, we have uh, 90 seconds for the answer. First of all, apologies for being late. I mean no disrespect to the community or to you, Jeff. I had prior commitments, as many of you know, I wasn't expected to be here, but I switched things around, and so I'm happy to be here. So thank you for doing this tonight. Public safety to me is keeping our families safe every single day in the borough of Queens. I don't believe it's increased policing. I believe it's increased cure violence programs. I believe it's increased mental health awareness. I believe it's increased drug rehab programs, which the district attorney could do in partnership with our communities right here in Southeast Queens. But there is no partnership with the district attorney's office. We have unbelievably talented cure violence groups who spend their days and their nights working every single day with our young people to keep them out of the system. Make sure that they stay out. Make sure that they have role models, mentors. They go into our schools. They go into our housing developments. That, to me, gives more public safety to everyone that's in the community. We have shown time and time again with our groups right here, hundreds of days go by without gun violence. Hundreds of days go by without violence in our communities. And that's because of the great work they do. The one thing they don't have, the one thing they don't have is partnership with the district attorney's office. We need to make sure we're diverting more of our young people. It lowers recidivism, recidivism and it makes sure that the communities are in fact safer while while making sure that we give people an opportunity to thrive and come into their own. And I believe public safety is greatly increased when we make sure that we have that partnership between our law enforcement and our communities. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Kent, I'd also like to ask you the question uh, the others answered when you were walking in. It's that the race is getting uh, a lot of national attention, uh, national money, endorsements from figures outside of Queens. Do you think that that is a good thing, that there's national interest, or would you prefer this race really be one uh, just within Queens or within New York City? I think the energy that has been brought to the Democratic Party is amazing. 
I think that the debates that are going around countrywide about things that matter to the Democratic Party, like criminal justice reform, like women's rights, like health care, I think that whoever brings that energy to the office, that's to the party, I think that's a great thing. But I started my campaign with 300, over 300 community people, not elected officials, cure violence leaders, drug rehabilitation folks, uh, heads of all the immigrant populations that are in this borough. We stood in a park and we said together, months and months ago, we trust Melinda Katz, we think that she will use her judgment as the district attorney, and we, are, we know her for so many years that whatever the discretion is that the DA has, that is what she is gonna bring with good judgment to the district attorney's office. The national politics is great, but the next district attorney needs to be chosen by the people of Queens County. We're the ones that live here. We're the ones who have to support the office. We're the ones who have to work with our children. And we're the ones who can end violence here in this borough. So I think from a national perspective, it is a good argument to have. And the energy has been amazing. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so now a last question from me for the candidates. Uh, when you're elected district attorney, how will you hold yourself accountable? Is there one statistic you'll be looking at particularly? Is there one group that you'll be listening to uh, in order to hold yourself accountable? Let's start with Ms. Mallow, please. So I think the metrics of success definitely start with making sure that we are decarcerating and making sure that people are offered what I spoke about earlier, pathways to success and opportunities, whether it is through education or employment opportunities, dealing with their substance use disorder, addressing their mental health issues, or dealing with their, the issues of poverty that cause them to become involved in the criminal justice system in the first place. But I also think what is extremely important is the reentry services that I spoke about. And a prosecutor's office in the 21st century has to play a role in reentry. My executive assistant, when I was Deputy Attorney General, had a manslaughter conviction. We had three people on staff as restorative justice coordinators who were previously justice involved and previously coordinated, co previously incarcerated. And as Deputy Attorney General, we made sure that we partnered with great universities like Georgetown University so that they could have a paralegal program where they trained previously incarcerated or previously justice involved individuals and allowed them to come into our office and other law firms after they successfully completed the program. This is what a prosecutor's office has to do in terms of metrics and seeing whether I'm successful or not as a district attorney. The good thing about it is I have already implemented criminal justice reform in three major agencies. As Deputy Attorney General, as Special Counsel to Brooklyn DA Ken Thompson with the Conviction Review Unit, which has exonerated and freed 26 wrongfully convicted people, and as the head of a citywide agency, not just a countywide agency, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, which handled the Eric Garner case, which is why it went to trial recently, the Thabo Cephalosha case, the Atlanta Hawks player who had a broken leg, as well as the tennis pro James Blake. So you can trust me to get the job done because I've been doing it on the, both the defense side and the prosecution side for over 20 years. I'm not learning as I go. we had, how many charges, how many people we charged, because that was the old metrics. And all that led to was a, a, a mass incarceration of largely black and brown men from communities of color. And I think that is where we are today. Then what do we do? What, how, what, what's the metrics then? What do we look at? We look at how many kids did we divert from the criminal justice system and change their lives and gave them a second chance in life. How many individuals who are addicted at home of opioids and drugs, did we provide them the services they need to, to address the issue and address the driver of the crime? Address the driver of the crime. How many individuals who have mental illness did we provide services and, and make sure they got the help they needed because we were addressing the driver of the crime? 
And how many veterans who came back, who served their country, did come back and began self-medicating with drugs and alcohol because they are suffering from PTSD, did we provide services for? That's the new metrics. Because that not only promotes public safety, but it's the right thing to do. And it can reduce his crime, because now you're not just you know, putting people in jail for a short period of time and then releasing them back into the community they come from without addressing the issue. You're attacking the driver of the crime. You're, atta you're attacking the base of what's going on in the community and what you need to change. That has to be the new vision of the next district attorney, and that will be my vision as district attorney. Thank you. As I said before, I'm going to hire 18 community assistants, one for each assembly district. I'm going to gauge my performance on the feedback I get from them, and I'm going to gauge my performance from the feedback I get from you, 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 and you, because I'm going to be out in the community. I lived the first half of my life in Woodside, and the second half in Richmond Hill, where my wife and I have lived for the last 33 years. I love Queens, never going to leave Queens. I'm also going to gauge it by the feedback I get from the different agencies that interact with the DA's office. And they will tell me if I'm doing something that they don't uh, take kindly to or that's not productive. I have a great relationship with all the agencies that come into the courtroom. The police department, most of the unions have endorsed me. The court officer's union has endorsed me. The court clerk's union has endorsed me. Anyone that has any dealings with the courthouse has been in favor of my candidacy. I have grown up in Queens. I know hundreds and hundreds of people in Queens, and I will be serving the people of Queens. I've served you already for all these years. 25 years of my life I dedicated to the DA's office. 19 of those I was either a bureau chief of homicide or executive assistant DA. I left there as the number three person. I left the bench as the number two judge. And my record speaks for itself. I'm the only candidate been endorsed by the Daily News and the New York Post. They both said my experience is unmatched. And I hope to serve you come next January. Thank you. I couldn't 
next find time, it. thank and you. And you should be able to find it your own selves. Thank you. All right, for these upcoming questions, uh, just a note to our candidates, so let's keep these answers to just one minute so we can get through more of them. Because it's an exciting time, we're moving away from me, we're going to the audience questions. I'd like to welcome up Rena Caritha Johnson from Forward US once again. structural and institutional racism as it relates to the mass arrest and incarceration of black and Latinx people. So I, I have trouble standing up with the microphone, but I'm also going to lose my voice if I yell. Um, people of color get arrested more than people that are white. Mass incarceration is longer more for people of color. Bail is higher for people of color. We need to make sure that there is a way that we can responsibly report back to the community every year. There is a reason that the district attorney has to run for office. There is a reason that we have to answer to you every four years. There's a reason that they wanted community involvement in the decision that the district attorneys make. So we will not only have um, a justice report every year telling you the information that is happening in the office. But as I do at Queensborough Hall, I work with organizations every day, and they come in with an immigration group that works with 70 not-for-profits and 30 city agencies to make sure that everyone is being treated equitably and fairly. That is clearly not happening here in Queens County in the criminal justice system. And we need to make sure that we put checks and balances in place. The justice report is a good start. We need a, um, a uh, committee that allows folks to come back into the community and second chance employment, which we have been doing already at Borough Hall. So we want to report back to the community. I took more than a minute, but I have a microphone. Sorry, I will put it down and I appreciate the question. So this is actually where experience matters. Recently, I introduced the data transparency initiative that I plan to implement at the district attorney's office, which is something I also did at the Civilian Complaint Review Board for allegations and complaints of mis police misconduct. So under the data transparency initiative, we are going to be at looking at all of the data in terms of the cases that come in, the types of arrests that come in, the types of cases that people are arrested on, the demographics of the people who are arrested, as well as the demographics of the officers. And we're gonna track those cases from inception up until case resolution. And analyzing that data will tell us if there are any racial disparities in the system that we need to deal with. And so as district attorney, I would be making sure that we're looking and analyzing that important data so that we can deal with the structural racism, the, structure, the institutional racism from within and addressing those assistant district attorneys that show implicit bias, that show cultural sensitivity or need cultural sensitivity training as well as racial bias training. And this is why experience matters because I've already done it in another agency and I know what needs to be done in this one. As district attorney, I'll change the structure of the office. I'll change the structure of the office to make it more diverse. That's the first thing we're gonna do as district attorney, and the diversity has to be from the top down, which means the district, district attorney himself, or himself has to be from a community of color, because I believe that that, that that will bring an experience, a life experience of the discrimination of the criminal justice system that has been lost, that has been void, permanently, because if you're not subjected to discrimination, it's hard to understand what that means, what that feels like, how that makes you feel when you have to worry about that for yourself and for your children. 
And I think that's what we need, diversity in the criminal justice system, not just racial diversity. We need gender diversity. We need sexual orientation diversity. We need culture diversity, social economic diversity. Because the diversity of the, of the office makes it stronger and it makes it more reflective of the county. And it will make it better because you have language access, you will have better understanding of the communities that we serve, and you'll be doing justice every day because you feel it and you need it. Thank you. One of the first planks on my platform was we have to diversify the DA's office in Queens. Not only in the assistant DA level or the support staff level, the executive staff level. The executive staff level does not reflect the community. It does not reflect the most diverse county in America. It does not reflect that at all, and it never has, and that must change immediately. In addition, as I said, I'm gonna hire 18 community assistant DAs, and each one is responsible for an assembly district, and they will report back and tell us what the community wants, tell us any changes we should be making in our policy so there is equal treatment and equal justice under the law for everyone. If there's a problem, we will address it. We've always, I've always addressed problems throughout my entire career. I've dealt with the problems, no matter how, how bad they were, all right? So I wanna get the feedback from the assistant DAs out in the county and we'll adjust things accordingly so it's equal justice under the law. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I, I am going to cut you out a minute just because it's cutting into the community's question of time. So um, please, please <coughs> forgive me for that. Um, the second question is, the Queen's DA office has grown immensely in the past few decades. Some people say more prosecutors leads to more people being locked up. Do you believe your office should be bigger or smaller by the end of your term? So I think that the, you know, the size of the office is not, shouldn't be the focus. I think it's the service that we provide and the relationship that we have with the community. Because we're one of the smaller offices in the city of New York and we, you know, don't have the resources other district attorney's offices already have. So we're already working with limited resources. I don't think that making it smaller is gonna achieve the goal of public safety, is gonna achieve the goal of criminal justice reform. I think what you have to do is you have to diversify the criminal justice, well, diversify the office, and making sure you're using your resources smarter and you're partnering with the community. Because when you partner with the community, you amplify your resources, you amplify your ability to reach out and make a difference in each and every community. And that's why as district attorney, you'll see me at the community, you'll see me at the community board meetings, you'll see me at the precinct council meetings, you'll see me at the schools. Because it shouldn't be that the only time you see a district attorney is because when you're in trouble. That should not be the case. Thank you. office is actually one of the smaller district attorney's office in the city. I worked at the Brooklyn district attorney's office and it is about 1,200, 1,300 employees. The Queens district, district attorney's office is 600 employees approximately. And so I think that we need to think about how we're using those resources as we're going forward. Certainly if crime continues to go down, as it has been from the 1980s and the 1990s, where we're at, we're at historic lows of crime being low, then we need to reevaluate our resources and services and how many employees we have. But we are a county of 2.4 million people. Brooklyn is a county of 2.6 million people, and we only have 600 employees in the Queens DA's office versus 1,200 in the Brooklyn DA's office. So I think reevaluating as we go along and seeing the, the crime trends as we evolve in terms of going into the future. So from the get-go, we need to add a few um, units to the district attorney's office. I believe 
We need to divide the gang unit and the hate unit, um, hate crimes unit, uh, as a bureau. Right now, they are together. It is very different bureaus that deal with hate crimes and very different bureaus that deal with gang violence. Different investigative units, different DA's uh, expertise, different uh, CIs, all of the differences they can make sure that we are stopping those types of crimes in the borough of Queens. We also need an immigration unit. We need a unit that has immigration lawyers who collaborate with the other bureaus to make sure that there are not unintended consequences of deportation and all that comes with immigration issues. And that's an immigration unit, by the way, to protect immigrants. It is not one to go after them. It is to make sure that their rights are not being violated as they are being charged, to make sure that there are protections in place for them. But you only can do that if you collaborate with all the other bureaus. But last but not least, I know that I want to increase the cure violence groups and all of the groups that go into our schools, community liaisons, people that work and live in the community to report back to the DA's office exactly how we respond to the needs of our neighborhoods and families. Thank you. It has grown over the years and now the crime rate is down, but it hasn't really decreased much in size. I think we should just add additional units where necessary, focus on the violent crimes. Uh, the Homicide Bureau, for example, should handle the cases vertically, as should the Career Criminal Bureau, should handle the cases vertically, and that would cause a, a transfer of people from the lower units, the less violent units, the Criminal Court Bureau, for example, into the other major bureaus where they could, you know, have less of a caseload. What happens is, as the crime rate went up, the caseloads increased. You guys were carrying eight homicides and they were carrying 22 homicides, 23 homicides, and there was no money for any other personnel. So it's just an evaluation and redistributing the personnel in the office. That's the best way to deal with it. Thank you. Next question is, are you aware how much of the Queens DA office has in civil asset forfeiture funds and how do you plan to use that money if elected? Last I checked, they had $113.5 million in civil forfeiture funds. That money was used a few years ago to buy new police cars for the police department. We need to make sure that that, we need to make sure that, that money is used in order to make sure that people don't end up in the system. We talk a lot about criminal justice reform, about those folks that end up in our system. How about we keep them out of the system in the first place? How about we make sure that our young people don't want to pick up a gun? How about we make sure that we send people who have done time into our schools to teach our young people about a better path to take, to make sure that they know that they are better off not picking up a gun than they think they are picking one up. Make sure that they are role models. Make sure that when people get picked up, like happens in the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island right now, they get diverted into drug rehabilitation and they get choices. They don't automatically get locked up and it follows them for the rest of their lives. So the forfeiture money needs to go to make sure that they are funded in all of these programs. Because at the end of the day, it will be less expensive for the people of Queens. And by the way, it's the right thing to do to make sure that our kids don't end up in the system. Thank you. So I do think that we should be using the money from the asset forfeiture fund in terms of giving back to the community and reinvesting in our communities. And one way that we can do that is make sure that we're investing in programs that for our youth, that keep them out of trouble and out of the streets so that they're doing positive things with their lives. Investing with programs like the Cure Violence Model so that we're interrupting gun violence and sending credible messengers and violence inter interrupters into the community before violence starts. And also working where we can with our NYCHA housing because I understand from being at the Redfern Redfern houses as well as the Queensbridge houses the other day for a debate and forum there. I think you were absent for both, both Ms. Katz. We need, we need to make sure that we are helping our communities and our residents in our communities that have been historically underserved and disenfranchised. And in order to do that, you need to be in the communities to hear them out.
So the purpose of the $113 million forfeiture money is to reduce crime. It's a, for a law enforcement purpose. So the district attorney has discretion as to what reducing crime means. And that's when we get creative. And that's when we start investing the money in crime in programs, programs that will reduce recidivism, programs that will divert kids from the criminal justice system, programs to allow for more evaluation of individuals with mental illness so that we're properly evaluating, evaluating somebody and diverting them away from the criminal justice system. Programs like the CLEAR Project that is, that is practiced in Brooklyn and other jurisdictions where a drug addict who's arrested for possession of a controlled substance comes in, gets arrested at the precinct, and at the precinct we send a social worker to give him the opportunity not to come into the criminal justice system, to give him the opportunity to get the services they need, to get the help they need. Those are, that's how they're using the funds in Brooklyn. That's how they're using the funds in other jurisdictions because they're using it to reduce crime. They're using it to reduce recidivism. And that's how we should be using it in Queens. Last year, the DA gave $20 million to the police department. I support the police, but they have a multi-hundred million dollar budget. They didn't need another 20 million from the DA's office. That 20 million could have went into the community. Thank you. I agree, there's a lot of money sitting in that pot for many years and it should be used for the community. It needs a legitimate law enforcement purpose and coming up with some creative programs, especially to help the young kids, especially to help the young kids because the worst thing you want to see is a young person saddled with a criminal record because that stays with him or her the rest of their life, prevent them from getting into a good school, getting a good job or getting into a union. So we're going to have to get creative, come up with programs where we can make sure that young people don't get caught up in this system. We'll do everything to prevent them getting caught up in our system. Thank you. This next question is about turning some of your kind of prosecutorial prowess uh, internally. It's a two-part question. Um, the first is, uh, in America, police brutality has been on increase and officers have been put on desk duty. There's also been things that district attorneys keep called dirty cops lists, which are about cops that frame folks or engage in other types of misconduct. Um, how would you, how would your office think about holding cops accountable? And as a follow up to that question, how would your office think about holding um, your own line prosecutors that may commit misconduct accountable? So this is exactly the type of work I've been doing for the last six years. You know, after spending over a decade as a, as a prosecutor and as a senior counsel at other, other jurisdictions like the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office and the U.S. Attorney General, U.S. Attorney's Office in the Northern District of New York, I went on to, to prosecute correction officers who, did, who beat individuals in Rikers Island to an inch of their death, inch of their death. They were abusing them, abusing their authority, abusing individuals who, that were incarcerated, who were, who were not even convicted of a crime. And, and I also went on to become a special prosecutor because in 2015, after Eric Garner, the governor decided that there was a conflict of interest between the district attorney who was prosecuting local police. And because they were prosecuting local police that they had to work with every day, too many of these officers, like in the Sean Bell case, were getting off and they were not getting justice in those cases. So he, he designated a special prosecutor, and I was that special prosecutor. And I went from one jurisdiction to another, not just in Brooklyn or Queens, but throughout the entire state, holding police officers accountable for killing unarmed civilians. And I'm gonna have the same unit at the Queens District Attorney's Office. It's gonna be a civil rights unit to hold officers accountable for excessive force. That's what we're gonna do. definitely and always have held law enforcement accountable. I have a record of that. Going back to uh, the stun gun case, I got information where there was a man, a young man, 18 year old Mark Davidson was in a holding pen in the uh, Raymond Court, and I got a call from his attorney to come down here, 
and the young kid had burn marks all over his body. What happened was they were using a stun gun to question uh, people that were locked up with drugs in the 106th precinct back then. And we started an investigation from that moment on. And that investigation took on a life of its own. It was one of the biggest scandals in the history of the New York City Police Department. We indicted three police officers, a sergeant, and a lieutenant. It was a black guy on the police department that they would use a stun gun like this to torture young men to find out where they got their drugs from. I led that investigation and that was not popular to do 25 years ago. That was not very popular. But I did it and I did it on other cases too and I will do it again. They have to be held accountable, okay? Just like everybody else. Equal justice for everybody. Thank you. You need to prosecute bad cops. You need to make them accountable. And you need to hire them, have them at a higher standard than anybody else. A cop walks into a courtroom, they get instantaneous credibility by the virtue of their uniform and by the virtue of their job. And just lying under oath, that can't be the standard. I don't know how that became the standard. If a cop lies, and someone does time for it because they couldn't afford the bail or because um, they couldn't prove their innocence against someone else's lie. You need to make sure that you're prosecuting for it. You also need to make ADAs accountable and the entire office. Linda Fairstein's cases, they should all be reviewed again. It has been shown that she uses bias and the confessions were not good. It's not hard to figure this out. You also need a conviction integrity unit to make sure that you go back at other cases. And you know, they say prior mistakes. They're not mistakes. Quite often they were biased as racial profiling. But quite often the DNA will catch up with it. Quite often there was misconduct. And you need to make sure that you're looking at previous cases. And by the way, once you find a pattern with an ADA or a police officer like Scarcelli in Brooklyn, you need to look back at all of those cases. So as the head of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, that was my job. My job was to make sure that police misconduct was being investigated and prosecuted where appropriate. And as district attorney, I firmly believe in accountability, particularly for our law enforcement community. So I plan to start a Civil Rights and Integrity Bureau where we would look at cases of police misconduct and prosecute and hold accountable those officers where they are necessary to be held accountable. But not only that, it also comes from it internally. I know there's this, this talk about how DAs and the DA's office and the police work very closely hand in hand. And it's true. We have to have a partnership, but we also have to be able to hold our assistant district attorneys accountable where they do wrongdoing too. So whatever reporting requirements are required where an assistant district attorney commits some sort of misconduct, to the grievance committee, to the bar committee, I would make sure that that would happen, up to and including termination. But you can count on me to make sure that officers are held accountable because I've done it before. The question that I have for you as the community is Judge Laysat has gotten tens of thousands of dollars from the law enforcement unions. How can he hold law enforcement accountable and protect us, the community, when he's taking money from law enforcement? Just a yes or no for me to be candidates. Would you release your office's dirty cops list? Yes or no? Just a yes or no answer. Yes. Yes. Yes, we're unable to do so under the law because you know I have to remind everyone that civil rights law section 50A is the is the 
is the confidentiality, confidentiality statute dealing with police officers. So my answer is yes, but I'm not trying to go to jail myself. I think it's the same. I think that you need to do it within the law. I assume that all of us work within the law, so yes. I have the respect of everybody's union in law enforcement, every part of the criminal justice system. I have the respect of them, all right? And I hold them accountable, and I've always held them accountable. So you don't have to worry about what kind of endorsements I got or what kind of funding I got from unions, all right? You want to talk talking about where money came from, I don't think you could stand the toss, okay? All right? What's that supposed to mean, Judge? Yeah, okay. Just last question from, from the community. Um, uh, several people have asked about your stance on the Chanel Lewis case. Um, I cannot find the question to read it. Uh, but several people asked, what is your stance on the Chanel Lewis case? And if you are able to, when you take office, will you be reopening the case? Free Lewis! Free him! My position is that the Chanel Lewis case will be reviewed by my conviction review unit on day one. So once my conviction 